I'm going to be talking about computer modeling in the social science of disasters, which is a bit of a mouthful. Uh, but I am an academic. I am working in disaster science. As you can tell from my adventures with the display, I am not primarily a computer person. Uh, but I bet a lot of you are here because I promised Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> I talked about how if you give social scientists enough computing power, we can tell you what would happen if Godzilla showed up. This was a slight exaggeration, but that's because social science, like the physical sciences, requires observation. And I haven't seen Godzilla anywhere. I also haven't encountered an ethics board that would approve setting Godzilla loose in a controlled environment, nor would I really want to. Uh, so in a lot of cases, we rely on case studies, particularly in disasters, uh, particularly because I am studying uh, evacuation from fire. And we're not allowed to light buildings full of undergraduates on fire. Um, I'm a graduate student in disaster science and management at the University of Delaware. I work at the Disaster Research Center. Um, my name is Eileen Young. Um, I work on the Interdependencies in Community Resilience Project, which is another big mouthful of a name. Uh, I'm primarily working with engineers, and we're working on modeling various ways that a disaster can happen. Uh, the engineers are working on things like buildings um, and how they withstand hurricane force winds, how they withstand earthquakes, um, predicting exactly what will happen to a building should a disaster occur. Uh, I am working on the social aspect, working on exactly what people will do. Uh, but I'm focusing on fire, uh, specifically the Station Nightclub fire. Uh, the Station Nightclub is, was in Warwick, Rhode Island. Uh, the fire was in 2003. It's actually a really well-studied fire uh, because uh, in many ways it makes for an ideal model. For one, there are no stairs. Stairs are really hard. Um, it also was over in under five minutes. Um, and so it makes for a controlled environment that we can see the beginning and end of easily. Um, a lot of times with fire, it'll start small and uh, it'll spread over a long period of time. Um, three minutes is great for us, not so much for the inhabitants there. Uh, and it w occurred uh, so, because I'm working in a very specialized area of modeling, um, I'm going to talk more about generalities. Uh, so here's something we can all start from. All models are flawed, but some are useful. So, I'm not going to talk too much in depth about my research yet. More generality is about what we think about disasters and what we think about how people act. So we've all seen the monster movies, the disaster movies, where something bad happens and there's the running and the screaming and people panic. People flee and panic mindlessly. Uh, and we're used to thinking about that as what happens. But it's actually really rare. Uh, people mostly don't panic. Um, the things they do that seem irrational are for complicated sociological reasons. Uh, but panic itself is really rare. Uh, so is looting in disasters like hurricanes. Uh, despite the fact that whenever it does occur, it'll show up in news cycles for a while. Usually there are only a very few incidents. Um, because people actually tend to be at their best after a disaster. Um, we've seen like the, the zombie movies where people are just become their worst selves and are doing the absolute worst things that people can do to each other. But people like to help. Uh, convergence actually ends up being a much worse problem in many disasters um, than either panic or looting. So convergence is when people and things will come together at a disaster site. Normally it's volunteers who show up because they want to help. But organizing that help ends up being a big problem because you need someone who's in touch with the people who are responding in an official way, and you need to be able to organize things. And 
a lot of cases, one way to uh, set those volunteers to work is also often after disasters, people out of the kindness of their hearts will send goods like um, food, like clothes, that fill massive warehouses and that do nothing, send cash. <laughs> um, uh, because dealing with the logistics takes away from people being able to work uh, in the ways that um, have the most impact on people. Okay. Uh, what people tend to do in disasters is also prioritize groups. Uh, and that may seem uh, counterintuitive, given that I've just been talking about altruism and how people uh, tend to be at their best. But people tend to look after their families when they can, uh, and after the people they know from their community. Um, there's just been some flooding in southern Delaware because of the hurricane uh, that hit. Uh, we actually did get some of Florence. Um, and the communities are coming together, trying to um, rebuild and deal with some of the flooding. Um, and nowhere is it more evident how people prioritize their groups than in um, fire evacuation. Uh, because those irrational things people do that can look like panic is they're looking for their friends and family. They might go away from exits because they're looking for the people they care about. And so that's been a difficult thing for a lot of people who are not social scientists to model because, you know, people should be easy to model. We know ourselves, we know people, but that's easy. It's not. Um, some of the ways that people have been modeled in uh, models that are coming from a more technical standpoint um, that are looking at structures and then people are just there because they were there and I guess you should have them, um, people panic. Um, or people behave with perfect rationality. And sometimes we like to think that we can be perfectly rational beings. That's not really true either. Uh, I think my favorite is a couple of models that had people behave according to fluid dynamics. I, I'm not sure about you, but I, I'm a discrete person. I, I don't flow. <laughs> uh, there are some things in crowd dynamics that can look a little bit like fluid dynamics. Um, we actually call that the supra force um, because crowds tend to move together, but it's still a matter of individual people uh, pursuing individual goals and just moving within that crowd. So back to the specifics of my research, um, because supra force is actually something that has been discussed and explored in research coming out of this fire, uh, because it is a very well-studied fire. Um, so I am working on a simulation of it in NetLogo, which is a programming-specific programming language looking at agent-based modeling. Um, and having it be specific to agent-based modeling lets us do cool things with easily applying what we know about group dynamics. So what I'm doing is looking at at what point during a fire group loyalty breaks down. Because the default is we care about people. Um, we're looking at different types of groups, um, coworkers, friends, um, dating partners, and family and spouses. Um, so hopefully by the end of this, I will be able to quantify exactly how much more you like your dating partners than your coworkers. <laughs> And a lot of this comes out of the drive people have to look for simple answers to simple questions. We want something where people can get out of a building alive every time. We want to be able to build something or design something where people just stop dying in fires because that's really inconvenient. Um, but simple answers and don't really exist because the questions aren't simple. Um, for example, one of the issues with the Station Nightclub fire specifically was that, so, the official capacity was 404. The capacity of the same building without any renovation a few years ago with the same fire inspector was 252. So, 
We think there were maybe some interesting discussions that happened between times. But there were 465 people in the building. There were 465 people in a building that was designed to hold 252. And so 100 of them died. Um, and so having fire code isn't necessarily the best protection, though following fire code is pretty great. And that's really good evidence that you should follow it and that this is a nice number of people for this room. I like being able to see the exit. <laughs> Uh, but because there are the human factors in the way the building was treated and the way people gathered for, it was um, a rock concert. Um, and it was a rock concert in a nightclub that had pyrotechnics. Um, none of these things are good things. Uh, one of the better parts of it is that the entire west wall of the nightclub, um, including where the stage was with their pyrotechnics, was covered in egg crate packing foam because that was supposed to help with the noise that the neighbors to the nightclub were complaining about. Uh, <laughs> uh, there are a lot of things that go wrong when people get involved in any endeavor. Uh, this just has a lot of very quantifiable ways things went wrong. Um, and people, people are the ones who create this, but people are what we have to deal with because, well, we mostly are people. Um, so modeling lets us at least conceptualize how to respond to these complicated problems. And that lets us come up with answers in a number of fields. Um, for example, one of the things that came out of the Station Nightclub fire was the National Institute for Standards and Technologies actually um, came up with new regulations. Um, new fire codes about having sprinkler systems. Um, some of the revisions to the fire code since 2003 were a direct result of this fire. Um, and so modeling is what lets us do that. Um, modeling in what I'm doing is hopefully going to let us better predict how people are going to evacuate. Um, and part of that is taking in the complicated, wait, the complicated ways people come up with their goals, the complicated ways people prioritize things. Um, this is actually the flowchart that is directly corresponds to the code I'm using. Um, at the start of the fire, um, people are chill. Actually, for the first 30 seconds, no one responded because they thought the pyrotechnics were going as planned. And it took them a while to realize that the fire was not going as planned. And it was kind of a problem. Um, it took between 26 and 30 seconds for people to start evacuating. So it takes a while for them to become alarmed. And then they ask themselves the question, are they alone? Um, if they're not alone, then they care about the people they're with. Um, but sometimes, uh, some people would be at the bar while the others were near the stage. So then they had to assess how far away are the people they care about. Uh, can they go to them? Um, if the people uh, they care about were near to them, were within arm's length, which is about two meters, um, then they could move on to the next thing. But otherwise, they were looking for their closest group members. Um, but if they were with their group members, they acted in as leaders and followers. So you, you all have that friend who, they're the ones who start moving. They're the ones who like make the way through the crowd off the subway. Uh, and that ends up being a really automatic process for us as people. Um, it's a bit more complicated when you're trying to make people behave in a predictable, uh, conceptual way. Uh, so we have a, various different ways, like people who were employees were more likely to be leaders, and people who had been to the nightclub before. Uh, and so we're looking kind of at the ways that we can quantify whether these people are, would be leaders. Uh, because crisis leadership is its own whole field. Uh, and then if someone is the leader, if someone is not the leader, then they're going to be following the leader. Um, if they are the leader, then it's a matter of, is their whole group within arm's length? If not, then they're going to be looking for the next closest group member. But if they are, uh, or if they came alone, then they start looking at exits. And even that isn't necessarily straightforward. 
because there were a fair number of people who had not been to the nightclub at all before. And the exits weren't particularly clearly marked. Um, so if they'd been there before, they knew where the exits were. They just went for the closest exit. If they hadn't, they went for either the closest exit they could see or the main exit. Uh, and them going for the main exit is based on assumptions, but that was also the main entrance with the banners, so we feel like it's a fairly safe assumption. But checking the assumptions that you're using is also a really big part of modeling and social science because you want to make sure you're not introducing your biases in a way that will influence your results. Um, but speaking of results, so because this is a well-studied fire, there have been a number of different models in, that have run in various ways. Um, I've been starting to get preliminary results, which is really exciting. Um, and this is preliminary results where the social stuff is all working, but this run was actually when people were still walking through walls, because I, as I said, I am a social scientist, not necessarily primarily a programmer. I fixed the walls, though. People don't walk through walls anymore. Um, we joked at the beginning of this project that I had fixed things forever because people could walk through walls and were immune to fire. Now we just need to make that a reality. Um, but because I'm working from the social stuff, I was able to get 94% accuracy. Um, and this uh, is in terms of how many people died. And this is kind of a big deal because previous incarnations of this, have, people have published um, and gone forth and like, gotten their PhDs with accuracy as low as 77% or 80%. And so there's a huge jump there in terms of what, what we can expect in terms of what actually happens. Um, in most physical sciences, um, more than 90% is what you want before you can even start talking about anything. But social science, because we're working from case studies, because we're working with factors that we won't necessarily know about, like maybe you super hate your brother-in-law and you're not going to care that much about that uh, part of your family. Um, factors like that uh, make things complicated. Um, so as I said, there were many uh, previous incarnations of this. And you'd think that eventually we'd stop and do something new. Um, but part of working on this project is that we're not just building on previous information and previous standards. We're not just looking at like the scale of work. It's like, OK, their accuracy was there. I'm going to try and make it a bit better. We're not just looking at the different ways people have thought about the problem. It's also, because we're looking at disasters, we're quantifying what is often the worst time in people's lives. Um, and so for this, we already had an extensive data set. People had already done the interviews. Um, someone who works at the Disaster Research Center had also gone and worked with the medical examiner and found cause of death. And so we have that data set. We don't need to go talk to people. We don't need to ask them 15 years later Okay, can you tell me every detail of exactly where you were at all times during this worst night of your life? Um, and it, it lets us be more compassionate in the way we're studying it. Um, which is also important because it means that people don't hate us for doing what we're doing. Um, and it also means that it is a collaborative effort, that we're working with, in some cases, with the previous scientists. Um, for instance, the researcher who uh, worked with a medical examiner, she's got a map somewhere in her basement, and I get to get that map of exactly where people ended up. Um, but it also means that um, all our results are going to be public, um, because this is a National Science Foundation project. Um, and this lets us make everything. I actually got permission from the PIs to make my current code public if you want to see exactly how this is working, exactly how we've been approaching this. Um, partly because I wanted to make it public before I came to this, partly because I've been working for a year on this. I've been working for a year on getting people to stop walking through walls. 
my friend Piper has, keeps threatening to rebuild the entire thing in Python in an afternoon. Um, and so <laughs> uh, there's a difference. In, so I know the social stuff. I've been working on the social stuff. Um, so I can contribute a lot of stuff in terms of accuracy. But I'm not a programmer. You guys are programmers. This is now public. Um, and I think working together on this kind of thing, if it is the kind of project you would be interested in, is the way to get the best science that can help the most people in the most efficient amount of time. Um, so the takeaway is that modeling is important. Um, and it's useful in a lot of fields. Um, fire code, um, kind of the shoot for the moon goal with what I'm doing is to be able to predict where people will go in real time. Um, because in search and rescue, uh, infrared is not useful. In search and rescue from fires, uh, infrared is not useful. But if we can tell where people are going to be based on whatever information we can gather about them at the time, we can maybe find people faster. We can maybe help people survive. Um, but you need both social scientists and programmers to get this stuff to work as well as it can. And there is my GitHub. Um, questions? He was asked uh, what, if I could tell what in my model was making the accuracy increase over previous models. Um, a lot of it's the way that people were setting their goals. Um, because uh, one of the major sources of inaccuracy is having people behave in different ways. So having them be able to prioritize their family members so they're over in a different part of the building um, when they start to evacuate or when the fire spreads more. Um, allows significantly greater accuracy because it ended up with more people went towards the stage um, rather than staying in the bar. The bar had two doors. Um, the stage had many people that people cared about, but one door. Um, and, and so having, uh, having the priorities is, has made the biggest difference. So the takeaway, the takeaway would be uh, make sure you do the movie theater thing and say the exits are here, here, here. Around and see which one's closest to you. And then the emergency goes out. Yeah. Um, which is what we would prefer people to do, actually. Part of the uh, short intro to the, uh, my work is if there's a fire, ditch your friends and meet them outside. Um, everyone is much more likely to survive if no one displays group loyalty. Um, but we can't exactly mandate that people behave better. Um, because in a lot of ways, it's just a matter of dealing with people. And so we end up trying to optimize buildings. Um, and it's actually part of the reason that the um, more dramatic, brighter uh, exit signage um, ends up being a lot more That's prevalent. That's the part that I was referring to. OK, because yeah. What you're saying is that they knew about the exits, and they went the other way. Anyway. Yep. OK. Yes. Uh, so this is really interesting research, right? I was just thinking that, you know, for example, the building, there is uh, the culture goes around it because they have the map and everything, right? And so they know where is the exit, where is everything, so you can get the data. And also you know when there's any construction or any modeling being done, what material is being put on the walls, it's in the design maps. So basically you already have the data about everything you know. So maybe do you include that in your model? So you can easily tell that last, like in this area, 10 miles, which building is where, what are the maps, what kind of walls they have, where is the door, where is the bathroom. And you can also track the cell phone activity and say where people are most crowded in, you know, because you have Google Fit and you have all the data with you. That's sort of the ideal. Um, right now I'm working with a data set that is anonymized based on the data collection people have done. And I'm also um, working only with blueprints of the one building. 
Um, part of that's just because of the computing limits I'm hitting. Like, I'm already hitting that I'm waiting for a new computer next week because my model's too large to run on my current one. Um, and so the constraints like that um, end up dictating a lot of it. Uh, the overarching project, though, is looking at um, being able to model on a city scale using accurate blueprints. Um, and we're hoping to have a distributed uh, system where people can um, have different types of model work together. Um, like, what we're aiming for is having, um, say, I have a behavior model, and then someone else has a hurricane model, and someone else has an earthquake model, and then we um, model what would happen if an earthquake hit during a hurricane and how people would react. Um, it, like, being able to have the different modules work together, um, but in a distributed way so that we're not trying to run everything on one computer, um, because that is somewhat problematic. Thank you. Are, are you this as a visualization? Um, no, I actually do have um, a basic visualization. Um, and it can um, run that way, but I run everything with it off because to run 200 seconds with the visualizations turned off takes 14 hours. Um, so, and with it on, then it doesn't update frequently enough to make looking at it um, informative in any way. Um, eventually it would be really nice, but as it is, I am working from CSVs uh, with outputs of where people ended up in uh, like, the final moment. Yes? I haven't tried that. Um, actually, no, I did uh, try a version of that with um, running it with only about 50 people in it, um, which actually, when it was a restaurant, uh, this building has been through a lot of incarnations. When it was a restaurant, it had a uh, capacity of 51 people. Um, and with that, everyone evacuates um, before the fire is even critical, and probably no one would have even had smoke damage. Um, and I can actually probably do it with the 252 people, but I would imagine it would be similar. Um, so 100 people died in total, um, 96 at the scene, and then four later in the hospital. Um, and 200 people were injured. Um, so probably if we reduced the number of people, it would have been significantly fewer people even injured. So if they were at capacity? If they were at capacity, everything would have been fine. So is capacity, is capacity based on the fact that there would be no fatalities? Is that how they find the limit? It ends up actually varying by um, area. I, I'm working right now and putting together some information for an academic in the Netherlands on exactly how fire code in the US happens. And that is a really interesting adventure um, because it happens in a lot of different ways. There are a few different associations that do overall recommendations, um, but the regulations um, happen on a state level. Um, but the National Fire Protection Association, most of that is based on limiting uh, casualties and injuries. Um, casualties primarily, um, injuries of course secondary, um, but and it's based, I think, primarily on how rapidly people can evacuate. Um, so with this, it actually, their capacity was 404 if they took all the tables out. It was only 360 if, if they had only some of the tables out. Um, they had all of the tables in. They were just pushed up against the wall. Yes? Um, do you have any data that, uh, that pertains to relationships between the victims? Because then, with that, if you have that, then you can simulate tours. Right? So simulate tours by, by relationship, and then from there, you, you, can, you can fine tune. By simulating tours, when this person is his first friend, or let's see, or not, not, then you can simulate those tours and then continue to uh, uh, improve the number that way. Do you have any data pertaining to the relationship between um, you know, between uh, uh, victims? And, yeah, um, we actually had interviews with all of the survivors. Um, so we have um, the data that's being used in the simulation and that's up online is uh, anonymized. But we have um, basically exactly what all of the familial and friend relationships were. Um, and uh, we have basically all of the information we could ever want about how people uh, felt about each other. 
Um, one actual the, uh, pop science book about this is Killer Show by John Berelick. Uh, it's really interesting, and it talks a lot about um, how individual people behave during and after um, the fire. Yes? Um, I think I might have heard him speak of the disasters that are talked about for a lot of people these days. Um, I don't know if your work, uh, if you've also looked at hurricane response uh, and simulation in the context of the work you've done, any of the major um, differences in how you use the plan for. So I haven't done any modeling of hurricane evacuation, partly because the, so I'm doing quantitative science uh, um, primarily. Um, the qualitative science that would allow me to come up with the numbers I would use um, is still very much being researched. Um, we know basically that the primary um, determinant in whether or not people evacuate is whether or not they have kids. Like that's it. That's what we've got. Um, we have a number of. We have actually a team at the Disaster Research Center working on finding um, more detailed reasons. Finding. Um, more concrete and, and nuanced uh, reasons to it that they can um, document about how people make their evacuation decisions, but, but that's still in development. Yes? I just wonder, does it make sense, or do you think it would work the same like, social behavior on the different model? Like, is it universal? Or, I mean, you can introduce biases. Yeah, um, uh, that's actually what I'm going to be doing for my thesis work. Um, I have also a data set from the Beverly Hills Supper Club fire um, that once I have this model working and I'm getting consistent good results, uh, I'm going to uh, code the data um, from that fire in a way that I can just plug into the simulation and see how accurate it is between the different fires. Yes? I would follow up to that is uh, the improved accuracy that you mentioned of the specific to this incident? Yes. How do you control for a statistical overfitting? Um, run it a number of times. Uh, and then that's part of the reason that I'm going to be doing it with the second data set. Um, previous uh, work on this has just focused on um, this uh, incident. Um, but I'm trying to expand that so we can have that rigor. So what, happens, what does happen when a Godzilla appears in I don't know. If one shows up, I will be first on scene to get that data. <laughs> um, primarily, it's probably going to be people with their camera phones. <laughs> like, we are a very curious species, and we like visuals. Thank you very much. <laughs>